Hello and welcome to Stateline. I'm Cathy Bolan. An eminent Victorian surgeon has lashed out at the hospital system for failing some of the state's most needy patients. Neurosurgeon Mr Richard Bittar says implants which can radically improve Parkinson's patients' lives are not being funded. The government says hospitals set the surgical priorities. The hospitals say it's up to the government to provide more money. Caught in between, Parkinson's sufferers whose condition can deteriorate irreversibly while they wait. And a warning, this story contains vision of surgery which some viewers may find disturbing. Well, Parkinson's has turned my life completely around from being an active person to totally inactive. Um, Initially, it was more nu nuisance value, I think, but uh, it's richly become uh, very challenging and has affected my quality of life. For 47-year-old Ross Collins, life has become a daily struggle. Just going to the letterbox can take half an hour, and this is the best he'll be all day. Parkinson's makes his muscle freeze. He can be stranded, immobile for hours. The medication to free them makes him shake, but doesn't work all the time. Jack, what would you like in your uh, sandwich today? Seven years ago, when Stateline first filmed Ross, the medication was working reasonably well. He was married and able to help care for his young children. As his condition worsened and he tried alternative therapies, the marriage broke down. These days he lives alone, has a carer come morning and night and his children visit each week. It's a lonely, isolated life. In the hope of some improvement, he's opted for deep brain surgery. I think I s still feel frightened about, about it. Um, this surgery was offered to me two years ago and I was f fearful of the surgery. but. I've come to a stage where I see it as being, as there being no option. Dr David Williams is Ross's neurologist. The advent of deep brain stimulator surgery has been the biggest revolution in treatment for Parkinson's disease since the development of medications in the mid-1960s. This very first stage of the operation or the procedure requires us to leave wires deep inside the brain to uh, improve some of Ross's symptoms and nothing's going to happen this afternoon or for the next couple of days. As in a second stage of the procedure he'll have a battery placed in his chest and then after that we're going to change uh, the electricity that goes into the wires that we put in today. So that's a couple of weeks down the track that we start altering the electricity to try and improve Ross's symptoms. We did lock those in. Is that in? Ross's head must Which be completely one? immobilised for the surgery and he must stay awake so the doctors can use his reactions to guide them as they insert the wires. Every millimetre is plotted out on the diagnostic imaging equipment. This is a, a GPS system for the brain. It allows us to look at the, um, the, the very small, deep structures within the brain and fairly accurately line up where we are going to put the electrode itself. The surgery is painstakingly slow. With no room for error, every step must be precise. Neurosurgeon Richard Bittar learned the technique in London. Does that feel OK? Yes. You let me know if you feel anything sharp, OK? I know of, people, of a person who's had this procedure three times and uh, he's received little benefit. And yet, I know of people who've got enormous benefit from the surgery. And I hopefully I'll fall into that category. Does it hurt at all? The surgeon says the timing of the deep brain surgery is critical to the outcome. The earlier that you operate on these patients, the better the outcome. Once you get to the point where your medications aren't giving you the type of benefit that you would like or that you're developing significant side effects from the medications themselves, then that's the time to consider surgery. Ross Collins has waited all year for this operation. It was cancelled three times at the Alfred Hospital, when it would have been publicly funded. To make sure it happened, Ross moved to St Vincent's private, but even with his private health insurance, it's costing an extra $20,000 
which his father is paying. Neurosurgeon Richard Bittar says there are hundreds of patients who could benefit from this surgery, but it's rarely funded in public hospitals. The problem is that the cost of the implant itself is of the order of $30,000, and that's a, a fair bit of money um, that's going to have to come from somewhere. At the moment, again, with the exception of Royal Melbourne Hospital, the other hospitals seem to be very reluctant to find the money. They either can't find it or they want to use the money for other things. And it's been very difficult. They will always say, well, you know, the government should be providing us with more funds. And, you know, we can have this back and forwards argument between the, the two groups. But at the end of the day, these are sick Australians. They're patients that have a significant neurological illness. They're often patients that have worked all of their lives paying taxes and they deserve a lot better than this. I'm not certain of the reasons why this has been singled out as a procedure where you have to have special approval or special um, access to funds to be able to get the hardware implanted in. It doesn't make sense to me. And in, for example, in someone like Ross's case, who's a young, productive person who can be transformed by this sort of operation. Not only can the patient's life be transformed, the community can save a fortune on medical and pharmaceutical bills. But the surgeon's concerns are falling on deaf ears. The Alfred Hospital, where Ross Collins was originally scheduled to have his surgery, says it performs 12 such operations each year, and that won't change unless the government funds more of them. The government says it's up to the hospitals to determine their priorities. I think that there needs to be a greater recognition from both the government and the hospitals that this type of surgery is important. It is providing patients and the community with a significant benefit and that it needs to be funded properly. This is not something that you can do in a half-hearted manner. We need to have a long-term um, plan for these patients to get their surgery. We need to have reliable and recurrent funding and that has to come from somewhere. Tap your thumb and finger together, big and fast, big and fast, and open and close the hand. Ross's doctors are very happy with his operation, though it will be some weeks before it's clear if it's been a success. Ross's operation went extremely well in terms of the results that we got on the operating table and also the post-operative imaging. So I think things, that went, things went as well as they possibly could have. In the operation we got some very good indicators that his stiffness and his muscle movements were much improved when we put a small amount of electricity in, so we're hopeful that that's going to be an indicator that down the track we'll get a good response. It will take some time for neurologist David Williams to work out what level of stimulation and medication will work best for Ross. But early signs are extremely encouraging. When the deep brain stimulation was turned on, Ross Collins walked without his frame for the first time in six months. Mm.